start asking away, I just want to let people know who you are, make sure people people know the context of all this. And um, how I found you was exploring film on my own and getting a Super 8 camera and then a 16 millimeter camera. And I believe I found out about you because I was looking up online to see if anyone had ever made a feature film on 16 millimeter, but not with like an Airy SR3 or anything like that. If someone had done, like I have a Krasnogorsk 3 and I was curious if anyone had used one of those or like a Bolex, which I believe is what you have. And uh, sure enough, found out about bait and then um, followed you on Instagram. And then a couple months later, you posted that you were doing a screening in uh, Lincoln Center, uh, where got to see both of your films. And um, yeah, and uh, but during that um, screening, you did some Q&As. You were there. And I believe you also mentioned that you're a teacher as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I have done. I've done some university lecturing. I'm actually gotcha. the, I'm actually a pro professor at the at the nearest university to where I live now. So I do I do less teaching, um, just because I'm I'm sort of too busy to really do that. Yeah. Now, but um, I'm still yeah I'm still I'm still very much linked to the university as a as a professor, Falmouth University. And the other thing I noticed is that because um, when I found out about bait, uh, you know you won a BAFTA for that for best, what is it? I have it right here. Award for outstanding debut by a British writer, director, or producer. But the other, but the thing that I find that the, the reason I find that kind of questionable is it seems like you've done quite a bit before bait. So um, do you, how do you view all that? Is it, is it sort of like bait just kind of, I don't know, was that like a, a different chapter in your career or how do you view all of that with what came before bait? Uh, well, I mean, in terms of the BAFTA, the, the, the BAFTA criteria is quite straightforward that mm. you can, you you still qualify for the debut if you haven't had a film that's been released in, in theatres in the UK. Mm. So I had, I'd never had a film that had, had had a release. So um, it, it was a, it was a debut, but that night, of the BAFTAs, I certainly got a few messages afterwards from people I'd worked with on previous films saying, you know, what about the films we worked on together? <laughs> so it was, it was a kind of um, a technicality in the way. So, it, it, yeah, it was kind of strange to, in some ways, to win a, for, for a debut when in my head it wasn't a debut, but, it, but, but the BAFTA but the BAFTA qualifying guidelines are very much that it, that does count as a debut. But I think it, it it's it sort of really reinforces what I how my career has gone really. Where I was I was following a much more conventional route of working in a much more conventional way and effectively not really getting anywhere. Certainly not breaking through to a to a larger audience. So at the point where I went back to shooting on film and picked up a Super 8 camera and then picked up a 16 millimeter camera, then made bait. That certainly was the, you know, the start of that next chapter. So I think um, it's, I mean, it's very difficult to, to, to kind of define a debut these days. I think mm -hmm. it, was, it was much easier in the past because you were, you were either making a film or you weren't making a film, but now because everybody's, got cameras kind of everybody's making films constantly all the time and and developing whether they go on to have a career or not is is a different thing but you know you you can certainly have you can certainly have this huge development process in terms of a filmmaker much much earlier in your career whereas i i, I think for me my career was kind of um it started and then it had plateaued and then i was at the point of really not not giving up, but kind of knowing that I had to do something different to get up to the next stage, and that's and that's really was was making bait. And actually, it it started before that because I made a film called Bronco's House, which is a forty four minute long film that was made in exactly the same way as Bait. I made it a couple of years before Bait, and that was the moment where I I really thought, yeah, I can do this. Mm -hmm. I can make a film. 
um, on 16 millimeter, but not on an SR3 or 416 or, or, or a conventional 16 millimeter narrative sync camera. I can make it on this Bolex, on this kind of documentary or artist 16 millimeter camera. And I tested that concept with, with Bronco's house. Um, I think by the time I'd finished bait, I'd forgotten how odd a way of making a film that was going to be perceived to be because yeah. I'd just been working like that. And it'd become, for, for me, it'd just become a normal way of working. But I, I did the same things like you just said. You know, I, I went online and um, and looked up who was, had anybody made a film like this before? And the more I found out that people hadn't, you know, the yeah. less evidence I found of people doing these films, the more I thought, oh, I could... I could do this and that's not me thinking oh there's a there's a gap in the market you know i wasn't thinking commercially or anything like that i was mm -hmm. just thinking well if nobody's done it it must be it must be a crazy idea and so, on, at some level i think i'm probably quite attracted to that but you know look, there's a filmmaker in the uk you may know ben rivers who made a film called two years at sea which was shot on a bolex and all hand processed and um i've got to know ben now but um i remember back then finding his work online and and finding a clip on vimeo of him hand processing some black and white 60 millimeter film and i just put a i just put a comment below the video the vimeo clip saying what what developer are you using what timings are you using for processing black and white 60 mil neg and he responded and gave me some answers you know so it was it's amazing that, that getting that information off the off the internet and being able to be linked, you know, yeah. things like Twitter and stuff like that, where you can, you know, like you getting in contact with me, you know, or, or, you know, finding me through Instagram and stuff like that. It's amazing the sort of network you can, you can get that was, that was really difficult before. And I think that allowed me to completely change the way I was working. So I found this community of people that I could get information for, from or inspiration from, and take little bits of ways other people were working and then create my own way of working that entirely suited what I wanted to do, but also really excited me. And I think that was the start of the second part of my career. And that mm. effectively that became the debut because it was the film that in my head, you know, it was where everything kind of came together. But in terms of the way the industry viewed it, it was the first film that got a cinema release, Yeah, broke out of, um, Berlin Ale 2019 and then went on to, to find an audience. Well, one thing you just made me think of is I think I loved bait. I really, it was really cool. Um, and I think one thing that is particularly interesting about it is the, the story matches up with, I think the story matches up with how you made it like the 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 quality of the image the the you know post sync sound all that stuff like added to the feel of that you know i haven't been there but that's what uh it's in cornwall right where everything takes place in bait yeah so i haven't been there but it it helped like all of that helped put me in that environment and and the black and white, I think, helped with that. And I'm curious how how much of that was like is that just what naturally how it all came together, or was there any sort of strategy to that where you were where maybe you wrote it first because you also wrote it? Did you write it and then think, oh, black and white would be perfect? Or was it just did you just see it in your head and just you just made it as one organic thing? Well, the first draft of it was written in 1999 and it was going to be a found footage film. It was going to be mm. this fisherman who decided to make a film about his way of life and borrows a video camera, and he like a mini DV camera. Mm -hmm. and he records a, a, a couple of hours, a couple of tapes worth of footage of his way of life. And it was the same story as Bait, but it was all played out in this found footage way. Um, and that was in 1999. And then I moved away from that idea because found footage films were done to death. 
Yeah. And in my original idea, it was that the act of him put, picking up a video camera and starting to video his life became this catalyst for unrest in the community. Because everybody saw this camera and thought, oh, what's he filming for? And everybody kind of, you know, either were agreeing with his point of view or disagreeing with it. But in that time, camera camera phones proliferated yeah. and everybody was filming everything. So the idea that somebody filming something was a catalyst for anything became really unbelievable so i put the the film was the screenplay was on the shelf and then and then i went back to shooting film and made bronco's house which was written to be made or rewritten from an, an existing treatment to be made handmade on black and white 16 millimeter and then when that worked as a film and as a concept in a way as working i then thought what what other film could i do that's a feature film and I had this screenplay for bait, which at the time was called Shooting the String. And I looked at it and um, I thought that's probably the most inappropriate film because it was a, a semi-improvised found footage video film. I thought it's probably the most inappropriate film to try and make in this new way that I'm working. But again, I thought well, maybe that's a good challenge. You know, after 15 years of me trying to get that film made, maybe it needs to be turned upside down and shook around a bit so that was the one that that I chose and I, th I didn't think about the form and the content really melding together until people like yourself point out that the form and content are, mm -hmm. are, are, are melded together and then I think you know yeah maybe I, I think the thing is the the original idea was about form all found footage films are mm -hmm. formalist works, really, because they're about the impact the form has on the content. And a lot of them are form-driven as much as content-driven. And so for a long time, I thought I'd totally change this project from shooting the string, which is a video found footage film, into this very formal 16 millimeter film called Bait. I thought I completely changed it, but really I hadn't changed anything. The theme and the story was still effectively the same. Hmm. and form was just as just as important people were talking that for those first screenings in berlin when the when the when the film first got screened people were talking about the form as much as they were the content in the way that they would have done if i'd shot it as a found footage film so i think it went through all of these massive changes um and i thought they were hugely significant changes but actually it took an audience and critics to write about the film to, to actually point out to me that it hadn't really changed at all. The, f the form had changed, but the significance of the form hadn't diminished at all. Um, but that sort of, I, I think, you know, what you were saying about you, you not having not been to Cornwall, but kind of uh, seeing that the form and content work well together. I think that's a question of authenticity. And I think that's, you know, there's plenty of films that I've seen that are set in places that I've never been to. I think straight away I can recognize an authenticity within the work that you don't have to experience firsthand. It's that the filmmaker can can communicate that authenticity. And I think that's the I think that's explains partly the appeal of bait is that I, I hope there is an authenticity at the heart of it that, that people connect with. And that's to do with the content and and the form. You know, it's quite a I think it's quite an honest way of making the film. There's no there's no trickery in it. You know, we we shot bait with a, a group of very talented actors, um, a great um, production design team, um, and the camera and three lights, and that was it. You know, there's no there is no trickery within it, and I think people connect with that as well. I think one thing that drew my interest in it as well was going into it. I knew that I had already read a couple times about all the different things you did, um, particularly developing all the, the film yourself. Um, and so I think that added, I, I'm sure there were a lot of people like me who came in watching it, knowing that ahead of time. And I think that added to the experience as well. Um, do you think, do you think that's something you would do again, where you would, uh, hand develop hundreds of feet of, 
or maybe thousands of feet of film? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I really enjoy that part of the process. And it's, it's, it's funny because people always think it's a lot of work. Mm hmm. But actually, if you if you pick it apart, post production on a film is normally, I mean, the writing mm -hmm. probably takes longer than any other part of the film. But the like the writing is sporadic. You can be writing a screenplay for five years on and off. You know, even if it's a commission, you it can go on for years. You writing once you're into post production, that it might not take years, but it's it's very intense, and you may work for you know, get nearly a year on on post production and a lot of that is is obviously the picture edit. Um and I think a lot of the reason why that edit takes so long is because you have so many choices within the edit. And because I hand process or say something like for instance bait, which I knew I was going to hand process, the first thing I do is is not shoot too much because mm. when I'm shot listing or actually shooting, I'm thinking I've got to hand process all this footage. So only shoot what I think I'm going to need. So when we, when we wrapped bait, I spent about nearly three months hand processing, but once I'd hand processed all of the footage, it then got sent off and it got digitized. So I had some proxy, files to edit with which took a week once that got came back i had a day around christmas so we finished shooting in the middle of october i think i finished processing it just before christmas it was kind of scanned over the christmas holiday and then i got the the, the proxies back at the beginning of january so this is the first time i'd seen any moving footage of anything mm. and I got a hard drive back with the files on and it had four and a half hours of footage on it and that was all of the rushes so I sat downstairs here put it on the big screen and I watched four and a half hours and that was the entire rushes we had mm. then I had dinner and then in the afternoon I watched all of the four and a half hours again by that evening I knew in my head what the film was going to look like because I had a cool. shooting ratio of three to one. And I did two takes of everything. So really, I had, you know, I had a shooting ratio of one and a half to one. Mm. You know, almost every single shot went into the film, not necessarily in the order that I planned. So within four weeks, I had a rough cut of the film that wow. we were already looking at and going, this, this film's going to work. So although the hand processing seems like a massive amount of work which it is mm -hmm. putting the work in then takes loads of the work off the actual edit because by knowing you're going to hand process you shoot less so when you come to actually cutting the pictures together you have you have less to kind of um you have less to work through the other brilliant thing about hand processing the film is it forces you to not do anything for two or three months or whatever it was and the most important thing i think when you're cutting a film is distance especially if you're cutting your own work you don't want to go from the shoot straight into the edit because mm. you start sh I, I, I tend to start trying to cut together what I experienced on the shoot rather than what I've actually got in front of me so by having two or three months like uh, 10 weeks or whatever of not seeing anything so I'm working on the film, hand processing. I can see frames in the sink and I look at frames on the loop to check the focus and the grain and everything. But I'm not thinking, oh, I'm going to cut that with that, cut that with that. You know, it's a, yeah. it's a technical thing that I'm doing. So I think it, uh, uh, yeah, long answer to your simple question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I'll definitely do it again. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's kind of, it's scary because at the end of, the shoot of bait we had had a box of um whatever it was 130 rolls of film on the floor of my studio and that was it you know there was no way of backing it up until yeah. it was processed and scanned and every day when i went into process rolls of film 
I I didn't know whether that was that whether that was going to be the day when I processed the role and there was nothing on it, or it was all fogged, yeah. or out of focus, or or whatever. So, it, I mean, it certainly keeps you on your toes when you're doing it. But I would I would do it again. You know, I've done it since. I just made a short film, twenty three minute long film, and I I shot um, on the Bolex quite a lot of that and hand processed it. And I do, I yeah, I love it. You know, it's part. It's yeah. for me. That's part of the filmmaking process. And so if you're doing, so if you just did a short, what, um, what's, what's sort of driving you for that? Um, is it just cause you feel like it or is it cause you want to experiment or, or what? It was actually a commission, the short that I did. So the BFI mm. who distributed Bay and Ennis Main in the UK, um, they, they just put on a film festival on the at the BFI in, in London, Film mm. on Film Festival, which was just screening films from film prints. And they commissioned me to make a short film about my relationship with film as a format. So it's not a film that I would have made unless somebody had given me a brief and and a fee gotcha. <laughs> and a budget to do it. Um, but uh, so it, it, in some ways, it's a bit of an anomaly, that film. But I'm always making short films i'm working on another short film at the moment which is just a little super eight film that i've already shot and actually i shot it years ago um a little travelogue little diary film that i tend to i tend to work on on super eight so i've had a quite a busy couple of years so i haven't made any shorts um well the last one i made was actually in i shot it in new york when i was over in 2019 for the premiere of bait um, mm. and that that became a short film that was showed at the new york film festival couple of years ago called 29 hour long birthday which is just a five hour super eight black and white diary film so i'm working on a, a new one of those i shot i shot some footage in in la when i was over over there in uh april and then that will become a diary film at some point i tend to shoot this stuff and then process the footage then leave it and then look at it a few months later and think oh i could work out a a narrative and I write a narration to go over them, which just keeps me keeps me shooting, keeps me editing and keeps me writing in the in the sort of times when I haven't got when, when I'm waiting for other things that are in development to, to move on. What what do you normally do with um so I, I have a bigger question, but you've made me think about uh, your uh, the, the different shorts that I've seen. Uh, I've only I haven't seen most of them uh because i just see a list of them on wikipedia but i've tried looking for them where where do you do you have them all posted somewhere or how do people go and watch them well the, the bfi have got a collection of my shorts which are probably i don't know what the deal is with the bfi i know some of the bfi films are available in the states but not all so i think my collection is only actually available in the uk at the moment but it's, mm. it's something that hopefully will become wider, you know, maybe get some some distribution for the shorts in, in America as well and elsewhere in the world. But they, they tend to, I mean, when I started, you know, I, I do the normal thing of uh, I'd make a short and send it off to various film festivals. And, you know, sometimes they would get a screening and most of the time they wouldn't get a screening. And then I had a, I had a couple of festivals who were incredibly supportive of me. So, I had a, a short that, uh, or several shorts that were selected by the Cork Film Festival in Ireland, who, who were really good champions of my short film work and consistently showed my work. Also, the London Short Film Festival um, have been fantastic year after year showing my work. I actually did a retrospective of my shorts this year in October, and and the New York Film Festival as well, which have been really supportive, and various other sort of European festivals. I had stuff at Oberhausen and places like that. So it's gradually, you know, I think festivals seem to be, for me, you know, there's a there's a group of festivals now where I, where I seem to get my short film work shown um and then other than that it's yeah I, I there's some stuff has been online and I've, I've had it online and then um and then taking it down again because then i you know, had to deal with the bfi to put it all on the on the in the bfi collection but yeah like i say hopefully it will um they will get wider releases at some point 
do you have like um like a general strategy behind distribution or do you leave it in other people's hands and the reason i ask is like when i found out about bait it must i must have found out about it let's say january of this year and mm -hmm. the film was originally released uh 2019 and i would normally assume like in the moment i was like okay let me find it online you know and i couldn't and it worked out being for for the better because you know a couple months later you ended up doing a screening uh for that and for Ennisman. Um, and so I got to see those like in a proper theater and that was, and I think it was a, a 35 millimeter print. Um, and so that ended up being great. And, and now I, I've noticed that I see both of those popping up on different websites. Like you can get DVDs now you can rent it, I think on YouTube. Um, uh, do you, so yeah going back to it do you have a strategy with with how you distribute your work well we do now uh, with bait um we had a, we had a uk release with the through the bfi which was a theatrical release which did incredibly well it sort of um exceeded everybody's expectations here and the amount of, of um screens it it went on to and the, and the amount of people who went to see it we were just gearing up for more international releases including the us in spring 2020 <laughs> um and and then covid came along yeah so all of that kind of i was going to say it was put on pause it wasn't put on pause it all just went away because nobody knew what was going to happen so you know all those all those conversations that were being had with with U.S. distributors, other international distributors. They did everything was just put on hold, you know, and uh, and and a lot of the stuff that was early negotiation just went away and didn't come back. And and sometimes I think maybe yeah, some of the distributors didn't come back, and some of the cinemas didn't reopen straight away, and all that kind of stuff. So that that kind of killed off bait in terms of international distribution. With Ennis Main, um, we had Protagonist as the sales agent who came on and handled worldwide sales. Um, um, we and the BFI distributed Ennis Main as they did with with Bait. They did such an amazing job with with Bait. So we we went back to that team at BFI Distribution, um, um, and and then Neon picked up the the movie in the in the states. And so when they for Ennis Main, there was there was bait that hadn't had American distribution, so they picked up bait at the same time. Um, and off, and it had some, it had a limited theatrical release. You know, some theaters played it as a double bill with Ennis Main, but it was, I think, it was mostly to get it out and get a, like a home ends release. So yeah, mm. it, now you can get both of those films, which is a massive relief for me. Because, um, not that you know bait. If several years after its release, it was not going to be this massive smash hit or anything, but having it released stopped the endless messages I was getting from <laughs> how can I see this film in America, which is really, you know, great um, and very flattering and exciting. But I had no answer for anybody, and especially during the lockdown where everybody was desperate to watch stuff. Yeah. You know, people wanted content. You know, I was just. Uh, the moment when the bait release in America fell through, suddenly then everybody was contacting me, saying, "How do I see it in America?" You know, and I was just, I, I was like, "I don't know," you know, and I was almost like wanted to say, "You could probably find it on a, you know, on a torrent site." <laughs> you know, you yeah. can't say that, but it was almost like I wanted just wanted to put that up on on my Twitter or something, just saying, "Here's," a, you know. Um, so, so I mean, hopefully, all those people who were keen to see it then were able to see it and also people saw it off the back of um ennis main which is which is funny because ennis main was so it's such a devices divisive film for audiences that i think a lot of people 
coming to see Bate, having seen Ennis Main, will have certain um, the visceral reaction they've had to Ennis Main. I wonder whether it carries over to Bate. And where, you know, I, I, I do sometimes when I'm feeling particularly um, masochistic, I, I will um, I'll look on Letterbox at what people are saying about <laughs> my films, and I and it, I, I was kind of tracking just informally what the reactions to Bait were in the states compared to how Ennis Main had been had gone down, and also how Bait went down over here compared to how it goes down now a few years later. So it's been. Um, yeah, that that's the that's been the approach to um, distribution is just have it, for Ernest Main having protagonist as a sales agent who who kind of led us through it a little bit and, and advised us and and obviously sort of brokered the deal with Neon in, in the states and Neon have just been incredible, just such a, a brilliant team who've just I, actually just before we got on this call, I was just going through some some of the posters that they um, sent over because obviously the press release, the, the press, um, the marketing in the, in the States was a lot different to, to over here. So they sent me mm. a load of the American posters and stuff like that. I've just been um, going through all of them and just remembering what a, what a great job Neon has done and, and continue to do in promoting the film. And so is um, like, because I, I remember at the Q&A, you mentioned that you're, somewhere in the process of your third um feature um i i guess uh, i'm curious now that you've done those other two or the process of distribution rather um you know i i assume you want the ideal location for people to watch your films is in a theater um i'm i'm curious do you have a do you, do you have like a rough idea of what your strategy would be going forward where it's like, you know, like how long do you, how long do you let it, you know, test the theater market before you move on to online where, you know, people like me who are bugging you on Instagram are like, where, where is this? <laughs> Want to see it. Or do you just leave that uh... in the hands of, you know, like you said, you talking about protagonists and neon. Do you just kind of, wait until someone who can really who's done it and handled distribution do you just wait to put it in the right hands yeah completely i mean you know i've got my romantic ideal of how how the film will be released is probably based on the way that films were released in the 70s where you put it on and one screen and have queues around the block for a week and then you put it onto yeah. 10 screens and then before you know it you know it's yours but that world doesn't exist anymore. So I've got, I'll always, my, my, my ideas will always be informed by that romantic nostalgic idea. But if you're working with somebody like protagonist or, or neon or, or BFI, you have to, you know, the reason you work with those people is not just because they facilitate it all, but they, they, they come up with a strategy, which is more important than anything. Um, and they know the market, they know what's best for the film. And that might not just be based on money, you know, it might be based on, getting the best sort of critical response to the film especially if you're working at like if you're making art house films um so yeah you there's no point you know um selling the film to neon and then kind of going right i want it in don't want it on any streamers you've got to watch it yeah. in the in the cinema and nobody's allowed to leave while the film's on, you know, and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> they are, you know, that, but, but they ask me all the time and, and Denzel, the producer as well, they, they, we, you know, they consult with us constantly saying, this is what we're thinking. What do you think? And my sort of default is always, well, if that's what you think is the right thing to do, you know, especially with Neon, because they're in America and the UK and America are so aligned in terms of film culture, but they're still very different markets mm. you know so i don't try and um have too much of any you know too many preconceptions it's like if it, you know if we were releasing the if it was being released in china you know i wouldn't be advising the chinese distributor how best to release the film into their market yeah. so i think it's it's best to it's best to leave it leave it to the experts um but you know and i think a theatrical release is always um best and and that is, I think I'm trying to be objective. That that's not just the ro the film romantic in me. I think for a for a film for the types of films that I make, I think there's still a cinema audience 
for it because it's they're kind of art house films so that audience is is still there i think you know so um for as long as it's viable then it will be a, 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 i i think myself the sales agents producers and the distributors are all of the same mind that you that they the films go in the theaters first and sometimes you know sometimes it will be to almost like a loss leader to to promote the home and its release you know so the distributors might think we'll put it in the theaters to to raise the profile but it'll be you know, a bit of a loss leader mm. um but that'll keep me happy because i'll be going oh great it's going into theaters <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i won't look at the economics of it right um, i'll just think yeah i've got another film in the cinema you know and there's nothing of it like going back to what I said a minute ago about the BFI film on film festivals, nothing like going along and seeing a a performance of a film, you know, especially if it's on thirty five, where where it looks different every time, mm. and the real changes are slightly different each time, and the and the print ages and all that kind of stuff. Is that, but I don't think there's anything that quite um, uh, quite equals that. But then you know that now I just sound like an old git, nostalgic and. <laughs> reminiscent but i genuinely think there's something um special there's a there's a film actually i'm, I'm on a, a jury at a film festival in, in a few weeks time and i was just looking at some Straight of the in. films that are at the festival no no uh, <laughs> in uh, new horizons in um oh, okay. Kraszow, up in in poland um mm. but i was just i was looking at some of the films that are on and uh and there's a film that, from a filmmaker that i know whose film I haven't seen and I just watched the trailer um, on my laptop and I watched about five seconds of it and just switched it off and I thought I don't want to see any of these images until I'm in a cinema you know this film was made to be looked at in a cinema why am I why am I doing this I know it will be a completely different experience if I'm if I'm in the in the cinema so yeah um, yeah I think that you know for me it's important and I still think that for the people we're working with, um, sales agents and distributors, I think it, I think they still they work in that area where they re they know the value of that, you know, both artistically and commercially. Yeah, I I, I just I wouldn't love, want to work. I w oh, I was just going to say, I just love that I, you know, I, I love that I got to see Bait in a theater. I really like. Yeah, that, I was so going to watch we, it online we, if I could, but to see it in a theater was way yeah. better. Did you see it in the Walter Reed then? It was, was it? Uh, I don't, I don't think that's what it was. It was, it was just, it was the one at, so it was at Lincoln Center. It was a small theater. I don't know the name of the actual theater say, itself, yeah. but yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know what the, 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 so you were at the second screening. Yeah. I was, Did yeah. You watched so, them back to back. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, was it one night? Yeah. It was one night because yeah. you, well, it was like a five thirty showing for Ennisman uh, with the Q and A, yeah. and then right after that was the screening of Bait with the because I wanted to get to the both the Q and As. So and those were back to back. Yeah. So yeah, I saw those. Yeah, I remember that was a, that was the night before we came back for the because we had the UK premiere after the American premiere. So that was the, the night before. So I, yeah, I remember that very well. Doing the Q and A for did the Q and A for. Ennis Main, then straight into the introduction for Bait. Yeah, yeah. And then we all went over the road and had dinner, and then I had to rush back and then do the Q and A for yeah for Bait. Yeah, but yeah, so that's I don't think there's any better way of watching those films than you know in a, in a sort of in a theatre like like at the Lincoln Centre. You know, I don't yeah. think anything replicates that. No, and also having having two films being shown together added a lot to the experience too um because they did have their slight differences of course beyond just black and white and color but there was also just you know uh, a slight artistic difference with the the storytelling which was you know great i mean that's what you would hope for if you're going to see two movies uh by the same uh director and I'm actually that makes me curious is with those two films I don't want to say too much about like 
the difference is I, I don't want to take, I hate any sort of spoilers for people who, because people should go check them out. But is there any sort of, do, do you think that um, your next film is going to be again, slightly, slightly different, or is it going to be more reminiscent of one of those two films or a previous film you've done? Well, I, my agents just read the third draft of the screenplay and his note that he gave me was that it feels like it's a, it's a midpoint between those two films. Cool. So it's got a, it, it's it's a conventional, a much more conventional narrative. Lots more characters, lots mm. more dialogue on a very surface level, um, but still looking at the themes that some of the themes that are there within Ennis Main. So it was, it was interesting because that's how I started out thinking that and. I thought oh, this new one does feel like it's between those two. And I hadn't really had that thought for a couple of years and from when I started writing it. And then to get that note from him back, it was like, oh, yeah, that's that's how I originally kind of envisaged it. So I think it's, um, yeah, it will definitely be, I think it will feel like the third of those films that, you know, that it's not like a trilogy, but there's, <laughs> there'll be a, a, a theme running through them that's both, form and and content you know yeah. and that's not to say the fourth one might be you know the the, the fourth part of the trilogy and the fifth yeah. part of the trilogy <laughs> whatever the word for fifth and fourth is but a saga yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. so so i think um you know I, I think i could try really hard to do something as 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 different as possible but I think somebody would be able to identify it as, as my film if they'd seen some of my work. I don't think I can get away from that. Quite, it's like Peter Bradshaw, the critic over here, said like a, a completely unadorned style. Mm. Um, I kind of, that's, it's not deliberate, but that's because of the way I work. That's kind of, I think that will always be there if, if the films get bigger or the films get. Um, if the resources and the budgets get bigger I still think there'll be that kind of unadorned style which paradoxically is what some people describe as style over content when they're looking at my work yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there is any I don't think there is any style I think it's entirely dictated by the limitations of the way that I choose to work it's not, an, it's not it's, there's no affectation so I think um, although some people will always identify it as that I, I think that will always be there in, in whatever I'm doing I think. Yeah. And uh like this next film or between these three films, how much overlap has there been? Like when did you start writing this next one? Was it before you finished um you know post on uh Ennis Main? Yeah, it was way before. Yeah, I mean that's the funny thing with Bait and Ennis Main, they came out quite close together. Yeah. They would have come out even closer together if there hadn't been a one-year break for the pandemic. Yeah. But they were written 20 years apart. Mm -hmm. So Ennis Main was written quite soon before we shot it. You know, it was only 18 months-ish from starting writing it to, to shooting it. Whereas with Bait, there was 20 years nearly. So they so they, they come those two films come from although they were delivered almost together, they come from very different times you know i was like 20 uh, what would i have been 23 when i wrote the first draft of of bait and mm -hmm. was in my early 40s by the time we shot it uh the new one what happened was we were just about to shoot ennis main in the in the early spring of 2020 and then we went into lockdown and it was at that point that i started writing the new one because I because mm. I knew that I wasn't going to be shooting, so um, we got some development from film four, um, and I was going to write something that I was going to write a screenplay for a project that I had in mind for a long time, which was a project, and um, and my agent just advised me, said, you know, don't don't panic and write that script, you know, do maybe do something new. So myself and Mary partner who's the lead in Ennis Main mm -hmm. we um one night we just sort of we were just going to sleep and 
I just said I've got to come up with an idea, you know. Um, Matthew Bates, my agent, was saying, you know, just come up with a new idea and we'll, and, we'll, and we'll try and get some development for it, which is great in theory. But then you have to come up with an idea like that, yeah. especially in the pandemic when everything was like, you know, yeah. you couldn't concentrate on anything for more than a couple of seconds. And the idea of making a, of coming up with an idea of a film when your film you were just about ready to shoot has just been shut down and all the cinemas are closed and you think, why? Why? <laughs> what's the point yeah. what's the point of anything um, but myself and Mary came up with this idea for, for the film and, and I wrote it for about six months and then pre-production started up on Ennis Main and I was able to put go back into Ennis Main and put this other idea away and then had a break to shoot and finish Ennis Main and then I picked up this other script again and carried on again it was that enforced break that enforced distance that you never normally have but by working on two films at the same time because of the interruption of the pandemic it weirdly mm. sped things up in a way because I could jump from one to the other and when the post on Ennis Main was going badly or frustrating or I had a block I could jump on and write write this new script for a bit and when when I got tired of that or my inspiration ran out I jumped back on to doing the more technical bits of post and it, it, I think in a way they kind of informed each other and um, and now I'm at the point where I'm not really working on anything else I'm just waiting for the go ahead on the new script and it's a much bigger film, it's a much bigger budget we've got more execs involved so inevitably the process is slower and kind of more thorough in a mm. way so um, yeah, so I'm I'm kind of having to find other other ways to sort of fill fill those gaps to stop me getting frustrated with the with the speed things. Move on. What what is the so I'm curious what is the sort of stuff that you are waiting on? Is it is it raising money or is it the people involved have to have a certain level of agreement on the script like what 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 is is it you're just waiting for people to get scheduled and have schedules to line up or what what is it i mean the main hold up's me because i'm writing oh. it oh so you're still yeah. writing it I'm, oh okay i'm still writing it yeah yeah so, okay. you know what what normally happens with me is i i i, I spend ages thinking about it and mm -hmm. then normal procrastination you know, putting my record collection in alphabetical order rather than writing <laughs> and things like that. And then I suddenly have a very quick burst of writing that might mm -hmm. take a day, half a day or a day and a half. And the producer, Denzel Monk, the producer, or the execs who were attached to it, who are developing it with me, I'll, the script will get sent to them and they'll have been waiting weeks for me. <laughs> and then... I'll send it to them, and then five minutes later, I'm like, "Where's the feedback? Come on, I need the yeah. notes." Sort of thing. So most of it's it's internal, but I, you know, gotcha. worked with um, two two brilliant execs at, at at Film Four, who, you know, the process is you write a draft or you write up revisions to a draft, and then they give you notes, and then it goes backwards and forwards like that. So it's it's a, I mean it's it it's go, it's no slower than any other project, but. Mm. Um, the last few years i've been while i've been writing one i've been working on something else so i do, i just feel the the um the gaps but it's fine because actually mm -hmm. i'm i'm you know i'm taking a lot of time to to read stuff at the moment i'm getting sent a lot of i've just got um new agents in in the states who are sending me projects and books to consider and things like that so actually mm. i've got loads of stuff to do but i'm just i'm kind of at that point where i'm trying to where i'm convincing myself that getting up in the morning and just reading a book that i've been sent mm. for a day is work yeah <laughs> <You know? laughs> gotcha. it, it is what you know i've just read i've just read a book that i've been sent and yeah for three days i just got up and i was just reading the book and I was thinking, God, this is like I'm on holiday or something. But you to kind of tell yourself that, you know, I have to read it. I have to read it because I have to make a decision on it. So that's a day's work, reading a, reading a book. So, yeah, it, I think it's um, 
yeah, I, I, I find it difficult to, to sit still, but I'm kind of I'm learning how to do it this, this summer. Mm. And so like what, how, what, the question I want to ask, which you can't answer is when will this next movie come out? But so I guess the better question is once the script is finished, what, like how long roughly did the whole process take for bait and NS main to, to get, to get everyone on board pr- production, right. post-production and theatrical release. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't mind asking your first question really that I think I think the new one will shoot next spring. So I'm hoping by this time next year, we'll have shot it. What tends to happen is then I'll be in post-production for six to nine months. Mm-hmm. Um, so then I'd hope it would go into sort of festival premiere in 2025, and yeah. maybe come out later in 2025. I mean, that's the, that's based on, I can say that because I'm not, betraying anybody's confidence because that's not based on any of any conversation I've had other than the scenario I have in my head mm. um with you know with bait it took 20 years to get it to get it made and you know we shot it in September October the edit was finished by this time of year the following year so we shot it in 17 it was finished by July 2018 and I know that because when I was in the sound mix I was watching the Tour de France which I'm watching now yeah yeah so I know it was the exact time of year and um and then it premiered in Berlin the following February and then it came out at the end of August so we shot it let's get it straight we shot it in sort of late summer early autumn of 2017 finished it in middle of 2018 premiered at the beginning of 2019 came out end of august 2019 so from shooting it to it being in movie mm-hmm. theaters was two years wow. and i think that's probably i think that's probably quite standard really yeah and, uh, and again you i think it's kind of frustrating because you finish it and think right i want everybody to see it yeah yeah but then what happens is you have a strategy where you finish it to be sent to a specific festival yeah. to do with timings. And then you have to wait to hear back from the festival. Then you get your festival screening and then your date. And then you travel to the festival and, you know, all the eyes of the film world are on that festival. And some of those eyes will be on your film. Yeah. And then it gets a raft of reviews and stuff like that. And then everything goes dead again because then the sales start happening. Who Who's going to buy it? Blah, blah, blah. And then then it get and then you get it and then it gets sold to various distributors in different territories and then you have a nut and then that's really exciting and then nothing happens again until you build up to the to the release and that's the most exciting bit and for both bait and ennis main the bfi organized a, a tour for me to do previews so i did on both films i did two weeks solidly some often two screenings a night in different towns so almost like being on tour with a band, you know, yeah. you sort of roll into, you know, you don't know, you don't know where you are. You just get up on the stage, introduce the film, go to dinner with the yeah. cinema manager or you know the programmer, whoever, and then do a Q and A, and then get on a train or get in a car, and then go to the next place, and then stay in a hotel. You know, and, it, and it's brilliant because it you get this crescendo, and and I think with art house films, uh, introducing and and talking about the film afterwards, you just get this. You just get this sort of like roadshow momentum, and then yeah. by the time you release the film, you've had all these people have seen it, you've had all these people talking about it, you've had all these reviews ready to come out. Plus, you know, on a commercial level, you've got all of the box office of those screenings because we did like two weeks of and its main previews in quite some quite big screens for for British standards. Mm. And I think every I think every every preview except for one completely sold out. You know, so it's quite a significant amount of business you do before the film comes out. So that that's the most exciting bit. After all of these sort of crescendos of activity, yeah. and then these sort of lulls, and then and the important thing is you've got stuff to do in these kind of lulls. You know, I, mm. so whilst that was all happening with Venice Main, I was I was writing the first two drafts of the new script. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, it's not, it's not, um, it's if you're impatient, I don't think it's, well, you have to learn to have patience with it, you know. Yeah, and I just messaged, uh, I messaged Julie, who, who I work really closely with at the FI distribution, to they picked up a film and I, I messaged to say, when, when did that, when does that film come out? And you know, it's, and it's not until late this year. Mm. And it's a film that was in Cannes with us when we were there with Venice Spain. Wow. You know, but they've got this release schedule where they've got the perfect place to release in. You know, and there'll be all these other factors. But God, that's so, you know, I just presumed I'd missed the release of it. Yeah. But it hasn't come out yet. So it's, um, you know, some these things, these things take a, take a long time. Yeah. It's pretty wild. It's, uh, yeah. You mentioned the Tour de France, and I saw your watch. Are you? Do you bike or you run? It looks like you have a Garmin watch. I I I do I do ride. Um, I tend to. I've got into a real habit when when we had our second lockdown here. I got myself an indoor training bike. Oh, gotcha. Because I because our second lockdown was December 2020, and it looked like it did go all the way through the winter. And I thought I, I'm going to go mad if I can't do anything. So I bought this bike and put it in my studio, and well, had it at the house for the first now it's in the studio. So I, I tend to go and like as soon as we get off the school, I'm going to go to the studio. I'm going to watch the end of today's stage whilst on my bike in the studio. But I do, um, yeah, I do, uh, I, I I do ride as much as I can, and then I I haven't run. As my, I, I did run a lot, and then I had a bit of a, a heel problem. Mm. Runners tend to a bit of plantar fasciitis. So I had that. I've been trying to give yeah. that a rest. Yeah, it's a right pain. And actually, yeah. I got, I did that in um, when I was in January when I was on tour with Ennis Main. I noticed I was waking up in the morning with a sore heel. Mm. I thought, why is it? I looked it up and said, oh yes, you get the pain in the morning. You don't have it when you're running. You have it in the morning. But because I was running every day when I was doing this tour, because it's, it's a great way to see different towns if you just go out for a oh, run. Yeah. And um, and I uh, and then I knew I was going to be in um, in New York in March. And I and when I'd been over, when you'd come to see the film, which would have been in, no, was it in March? When you, no, it would have been in October last time, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, September. Yeah, end of September. When I no. saw it, I'm blanking now. I thought I thought I saw it like three months ago. Oh yeah, maybe you did then. Yeah, maybe you saw it something like that. Like I thought. Yeah. yeah, but but anyway, I was I was so when I'd been over before, I loved running around Central Park so much. Yeah, that I thought I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna give my foot a complete rest because when <laughs> I go to New York, I want to be able to do that ten kilometer loop. Yeah. Like most joyous run I've ever done. Like the fastest I've ever done a 10k was on that loop round. Yeah. Round there. Because round here, you know, you run on your own and you don't, you know, kind of in out in the countryside. So I, I never run with other people. So running on that loop around Central Park was amazing because you know you could just run with a group of people. Yeah. And then if you want to go a bit quicker, jump to a group in front and sort of run with them and you've got all these pace setters and stuff. So I did this 10k and I was like, look at my watch going, it's just taking about four minutes off my 10k personal best by you know and also you run um because it's so exotic to me I'm running around you know looking at the the building the coat of building yeah. and there's the you know and there's the um yeah there's the ghostbusters building and all that kind of stuff <laughs> yeah i yeah. i i'm a do runner you, do you run then yeah i go i run in central i was in before this before this call i was running in central park so yeah i go oh, the, wow. i go there almost every day uh, cause fortunately yeah. I live pretty close to it. And I, um, sometimes half the time I'm running by myself and then the other, about the other half, uh, there's a running group that, um, I run with. So today we are doing yeah. hills on the, the Northern yeah. end by Harlem. If you remember yeah. that big hill there, we went up the, and down. The that famous hill. Times. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I know. I, cause I, because you know when you put it into Strava or whatever, and it tells you yeah. the segments and stuff. And it was yeah. like the, the big hill or something. When I first time I ran it, and I said to Mary, "I remember going up the hill." Because around here, yeah. you know, the hills are sure. like this. You know, you do hills and you end up doing. You might do an eight minute. You know, I might run on the flat and do four minutes fifteen for a kilometer, 
mm. and then do a hill where it might be eight minutes because it's that steep. Yeah. So um, yeah, I did. It, it, I it didn't. Um, I suppose if you're doing it three times. Then, yeah. Then yeah, yeah. You'll start it, to notice it caught it. up on us. Yeah, <laughs> it definitely yeah, yeah. caught up on us. Um. Well, maybe I ran, you know, maybe I've, maybe I've, maybe we've run around the park together already. We just didn't even know it. Yeah. Pro- yeah. I mean, yeah, because we that was a good chance. We've been able, we we stayed at the um, the Empire Hotel. Yeah. By, that's. I mean, that's right by Columbus Circle area, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just yeah, we're just yeah, it's sort of halfway between. Well, just right on the edge of the, where the Lincoln Center is, really. Yeah. Yeah. Just opposite the fountains there and there. So yeah, just to cut, you know, cut through, in nice, nice little jog to warm up to get down to the park, and then yeah. round, and then a nice little, and then a nice little stretch on the way back. It was yeah. I just thought, you know, it's a cliche. I just thought I was in a movie, you know, running around. Yeah, it's no, it's great. It's there. my favorite place to run. It yeah, yeah. I love it. Um, I, I did think if I. I did think if I was in New York, I'd probably that's probably where I'd go to ride, you know, go and do some laps very early or very late. Oh yeah, in the day. Yeah, there's tons of people riding through Central Park. Yeah, they're pretty. Yeah. They're pretty uh, ruthless. They they go pretty yeah. quick, and if anyone gets in their way, they're quick to tell you. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. yeah. I think that that's the thing I'd do it. Um, well, that I mean that's New York all over, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's moving very quick, and uh, yeah, telling telling you what how they feel. Yeah, I, 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 that's why I think I'd go in there pretty early in the morning, maybe. Yeah. Um, I wanted to kind of ask you one last thing, um, since we just hit over an hour. Uh, I really appreciate your yeah. time. This is like no, so cool, so cool for me, so cool for me, honestly. Um, so, uh, one thing uh, during the Q and A, something that caught my attention was uh when you were talking about other filmmakers and part of it is because um i i know i know a an okay amount about cinema history i think from the u.s kind of point of view but i'm still learning a lot about um european film um, especially because my I didn't go to school for film. I went to school for theater. Mm. So um, some of this stuff I just learned from my own exploration online. Uh, anyways, uh, at one point you were asked or you brought up something about inspirations and you said, I, I believe you said something like, well, obviously Breeson is probably some sort of influence of mine or, you know, is the best or so, so, you said something like that. And I had no idea who Breeson was. Um, mm-hmm. And then I immediately went and looked up online, but I'm curious if you have any like two or three film recommendations, either by Breeson or someone else where you would uh, point someone to, to go exploring yeah i I read an article the other day that i was quoted as saying that the the best film school is watching the first and and i've said this before i didn't remember saying it in this article so it might be they're quoting from somewhere else i've said it online but if you take the first six six and a half minutes of don't look now by nicholas rogue 1973 and the last 20 minutes of bresson's l'argent 1983 there's everything you need to know about film which is a very flippant okay. thing to say and and really not true but <laughs> if you look at those if you look at those two i think i made i, I said that the, the university should run a degree a three-year undergrad degree where you just study the first six and a half minutes don't let down the last 20 minutes a large on three years there's a um i kind of said that as a bit of a joke but I think those are the two films that are real touchstones for me. Okay. Um, and another film that um, that's that's a big influence I've sort of come to much later is um, a film by um, Skolomowski. Is this Skolomowski who made EO, which came oh, out? Oh, okay. Yeah, I've heard about yeah. that because it got you know a lot of good press. Uh, I know I didn't see it. Yeah, and he he, he visited the Lincoln Center and um, mm. so he. 
he made a film in 1978 in up the coast from here as a sort of as a kind of Polish exile. Made this a, a story called The Shout, which is a a big influence. So Don't Look Now, The Shout, and Large On be the okay. would be the three. Also, Perfect. um, round about the time Ennis Main came out, the Sight and Sound here did the ten greatest films of all all, all time poll. Mm -hmm. um, the Sight and Sound magazine, and so I've I've listed my top ten there, and uh, so if you if you look those up as well, there'll be there'll be some stuff to get into. And also, when I was over in New York last time, I did it, I went down to Criterion and did the Criterion top ten. So I went into their right. catalog and cupboard and picked my ten favorite the Criterion film. So I think the Sight and Sound top ten and my you know my Sight and Sound top ten choices and the Criterion top ten are, are both published online. If you if you want to go beyond those three that I mentioned. Okay. Yeah, I'll look those up. Oh, and one other thing I just remembered is that you, I've seen you post about it. You're uh, a one of the judge or jury or whatever for straight eight as well, right? Or yeah. you're involved yeah. somehow with them, right? I, I yeah. uh, sent in a film like two years ago. Uh, we totally messed up the sound on it. Well, I'm, I it wasn't anyone's fault other than my own. I messed up the sound on it, but it was such... You've, you've got to mess up the sound cool. to some extent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it was a it was a fun project though. That was a cool festival. How long have you been um, involved in that? Uh, that well, Ed Sayers, who runs it, he he contacted me. Uh, probably I think it's probably during the pandemic actually, and asked me to 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 go on the jury. And I did the jury for two years, and I've opted out of it this year just because I've just been so busy. Mm -hmm. But it was something that's. I've always been fascinated with and, and have never had the guts to enter it because I'm such a control freak when it comes to sound design. The idea of, of not having that control over the sound design, I've got yeah. so much respect for those filmmakers who just hand it away. But we, we did, as part of the Film on Film Festival, actually, the BFI one I mentioned, they did a sort of greatest hits of, um, of Straight A and myself and, and Ed were on stage talking about it with um, Asif Kapadia as well. Um, and Edgar Wright was supposed to to be there as well, but actually, he, at the last minute, he had to fly over to to New York. But he he made one of the sort of the classic straight eights, mm. and there's a, a brilliant one by Alice Lowe as well, um, which I think are all available online. But yeah, I, I yeah. was yeah, I did two years on the jury, and I, and I'm, if if Ed wants me back, I'll, I I will go back. It was just this year I had too much too much on at the at the time when the judging needed. To because it's, it's such a massive operation that they run it's incredible really that you know they get all of these submissions and then there's the deadline and then they yeah. have to get it all the long list and short list and then all the final judging done and you know it's done very um uh you know it, it's a big it's quite a big jury um so it takes quite a lot of organizing and it was just a real short a very small window of narrow window of when when the judging would happen and unfortunately i dropped out so i i I'll get to see the winners, but I won't get to see the hundreds that that come yeah. in. And it's great. I mean, because I, you know, I think there was a time ten years ago when when it looked like Kodak were going to disappear, and yeah. and um, I think it it, it took a, a lot of very disparate groups who were working with film to to become very vocal and 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 really keep film alive when it was really at its rock bottom. And I think straight eight and the culture of making super eight films um, for for fun, you know, yeah. not for any commercial reasons. Because you do have, you know, you had like people like Tarantino and Chris Nolan and Spielberg who were, you know, one mm -hmm. end of the scale saying we can't let film go. And then you have things like straight eight, which are, you know, just this joyous celebration um, of that particular format. I think that the, the work that Ed and his colleagues have done is, is incredible and i think that, you know they just get more and more submissions every year which i think is that's that's pretty exciting for the future yeah i hope uh, not to uh wish for too much competition but i i hope there are more things that come about like that you know like uh, more yeah. film film centric festivals or celebrations like you said um it is amazing what uh, effect it does have on people though to your point when people just do it for fun whenever i use 
either of my film cameras. I always let friends, you know, I, I'm shooting most of it, but sometimes I'll let them shoot a, a couple clips here and there just to like look, you know, get that feel of mm. looking through and pushing the button and like feeling the mechanics and yeah. when and Ed, they're always usually a little intimidated by the whole contraption. But whenever I show someone the footage, it's like yeah. there's this immediate emotional reaction. Um, yeah. And it's it's really fun. So, I yeah, I hope it I hope it continues to uh, grow as well, because it's yeah. it's it's fun. It's a different it's just a different experience for sure. Um, that's it. It's just different. That's it. That's the thing. And I think that's I think that's what will increasingly happen is that the the difference will be celebrated. So yeah, this the BFI Film on Film Festival. You know, there were there were there was. I mean, the projectionists at the FI are amazing, but there, there, I was in a screening where there was one slightly botched real change, mm. and in you know we were in a theatre of four hundred and fifty people, and I think everybody felt a kind of sort of buzz of excitement that the real change was botched because you you just immediately thought there's people up there running the projector. This mm -hmm. is almost, you know, this this is film almost like a theatre performance. Yeah. You know, that thing of going to the theatre where a lot of it is to do with, you know, this, this will you have for it to sort of go well with the, in contrast with this feeling. And things could go wrong at any moment. So there's a different sort of adrenaline within the audience. And I think when you're projecting 35 millimetre, um, I think that, that has some of the beauty of a live event. And I think, I think having lost that and now it kind of coming back, it comes back and people realize what they lost and how it's a different experience. You know, just the fact that when you're watching a film print with the shutter, you're plunged into darkness. I'm going to get this wrong now, but you're plunged into darkness 24 times a second by the shutter. Yeah. So if you go and watch a 90 minute film, for 45 minutes of the film, you're sat in a room in complete darkness, which doesn't happen with uh, with, with digital video projection. Yeah. So straight away, and nobody would come out going at the cinema going, oh, that was great. I was, I was, I was sat in complete darkness for 50% of that. Film. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't consciously appreciate it, but, but the way you experience it is different because of that, you know, and it's not, it's not better. It is better, but you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. you know, you, you know, I'm not going to say that because you sound like a sort of film snob, but it's different. It's just a different experience, and, yeah. and 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 hopefully there's enough sort of goodwill and enough commercial interest behind it to to kind of keep that going and keep those projectors running and and train people in the art of projection, you know, because it is the it is a if it's not an art, it's a very important craft. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're the kind of, you know, the projectionist is kind of the most important person in the film crew because they're the, they're the final link between that initial concept and the audience experience of it, you know, and, and they're sort of so undervalued and, and um, forgotten about. So that BFI festival was great. It was just to sell it. A, a, more than anything, it was a celebration of projectionists. You know, every intro to the film, the projectionists would get named and thanked at the end. Oh, cool! You know, it just felt like this is a celebration of of that of of the of the live performance element of film, which is yeah, you know, magic. Oh, I feel like at least here in New York, I mean, it's it's a big city, so it's probably different than. Well, there's probably maybe only a couple cities in the U S that have the luxury of um, really good projection opportunities. Like what I'm, the point I'm trying to get to is that I've noticed here um, across the street from Lincoln center, there's a AMC Lincoln square theater and they have mm -hmm. like the second biggest IMAX in the country but they they're able to do uh the 70 millimeter IMAX prints with with one of those yeah. you know big old projectors so they're and the thing i've noticed is they people go nuts for it they're sold out like for Oppenheimer which is hasn't even opened here yet but 
is doing, you know, advanced ticket sales, they're uh they're sold out as far as they've released. And so yeah. it's clear there's a market for, like if 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 directors and filmmakers are willing to you know, put something out there a certain way, there's there's clearly demand for people people yeah. want to see it the way a director intends. Um yeah, but but also you can go and see it in a in a crappy multiplex for sure. You sure. Know, a, bar- a bargain price and in, in a digital projection, or you know, what, however you, however you want to see it, or you know, probably more tellingly, however you can afford to see it. Yeah. Um, all those options should be available. Yeah, it's the same in in London. You know, at the BFI IMAX, they'll, which I think is the biggest screen in in the UK. It'll be it'll be playing there for for weeks to to full houses. I'm yeah. sure. You know, this is when Dunkirk came out here. I travel. I've got there's two cinemas, a stone's throw from where I am here. Who are both showing Dunkirk digitally, or you could drive 40 minutes up the road to see it on 35 millimeter. And yeah, so that's obviously what I chose to to do. You know, and that the experience of seeing that film will stay with me because I saw it. I think you know, not quite how he would have wanted me to see it. He would have wanted me to see it 17 mil ultimately, but. Yeah. You know, Half, halfway there yeah um yeah so i do think there's that demand you know it's it, it it's you know there is that there is that cineast audience that will be there and, ho- and hopefully there is some crossover into the mainstream audience who will go right yeah as we're in manhattan you know that imax is just as close as yeah you know whatever whatever chain is there you know let's go let's go and see it let's go and see it big yeah, you can see it big and loud. Yeah, big and loud. That's yes. right. Um, well, hey, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. pleasure. Good, good to chat to you. Yeah, and um, thanks for reaching out. So you you contacted Matthew originally, didn't you? I, Did it come uh, through my agent? You know what happened? I saw. <laughs> if you want this public, I, I saw that in your bio, it said to contact a email. So I did that. Yeah. But then I noticed that I tagged you on Instagram uh, for the screening. And I think it, right. I think you liked my, my post or something. And I was like, right. Oh, he's seeing my stuff. And, and so I think I just said to you, Hey, I, I sent an email to that I sent an email to the email in your bio. Uh, you know, I, I hope sure. I hope it gets to you, kind of a thing, and and that's where right. we ultimately linked up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's the thing because I I get quite a lot of um, direct messages on social media, which I always try and reply to, especially on Instagram, because it all just sort of yeah disappears so quick, which is why I always put in the bio. I do, I miss the DMs. There's nothing personal, and I'd love to. I'd love to respond to them all. And it's not like I get so many that I can't respond to them. It's just they disappear so quickly. So I talk, yeah. that's why I always put my agent's um, email because he tends he, he he can handle it much better than yeah. I can. <laughs> <laughs> but enough. no, I'm just glad. Yeah, glad we kind of yeah made made contact. Yeah, no, yeah, especially. I mean, it goes back to the the whole original the beginning of this journey, which was just it was it was cool to see someone make a a feature on a bolex well multiple yeah <laughs> i mean it, it can yeah, yeah. be done and, and more it to can come. be done yeah and more to come can be done yeah yeah no it's nothing to be scared of with the, with the bolex i mean the, the k3 is a different matter i think uh, <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> only because i've it. got only only because the, the i had a i had a krasnogorsk and it, um it was a bit vicious with the film mm. Yeah, I but, just um, converted it to I, Super I, I know, 16, and I have to I have to play with it a bit. So I have to. Right. Yeah, I know plenty of people who who, who use them, and I've seen great results from them. And in fact, the one that I got was is Super 16. It was quite interesting to see that that wider image, but it, something happened to it, and it started just sort of plowing through film. So um, I've um, yeah, I've kind of I've kind of retired it. Mm. I remember seeing the picture of Spike Lee with it when he was yeah. at. New York Film School. Yeah. So straight away, if that was like these, got one that was the camera I was going to get. So <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what I got it originally. 
I think a lot of people yeah. have seen that photo and th- felt the same way. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's good enough for yeah, Spike. Yeah. It's good enough for me. Yeah. Well, you'll probably find out in years to come that it was totally posed and you never actually used yeah. it. Somebody just said, yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. I better head off. Yeah. I've got to go, Absolutely. Get, got to go and get my bike. All right. Yeah. Have a good oh, ride. Oh, and, um, appreciate it. I'll, uh, I'll leave um, links and stuff in, in the description so people can find you and find your film. So great. appreciate it. Okay. Have a great day. Brilliant. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll see you for a run in Central Park next time. Yeah. Let me know when you're here again. <laughs> yeah. I will do. All right. Mate. Cheers. Bye.